praise you. We will praise you. We will praise you. We will praise your name forever. We will praise you. We will praise you. We will praise your name forever. We will praise you. We will praise you. We will praise your name forever.
Bible says this, many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. It was 11 years ago, this coming June, that Beth, Jeremy, Jeremy my son, Laurie, our daughter, and I knelt here at this altar, and this pastor laid his hands on us and commissioned us to go to Liberty University to help start the Center for Worship and music. And during that time, I remember that night, I said, Lord, I want to really be able to proclaim the greatness of this good God that we serve. And I wanted to celebrate the goodness of this Lord. So let me just share with you what Olive Baptist Church has done at Liberty University. I've been looking forward to the day I could just come back and say, thank you. Not thank you for sending us, but thank you for the influence and the contribution you made to our lives. We started this program in the fall of 2005 with 89 students. The next semester, we had 215 students. The next semester, we had 318 students. The next semester, 368 students. And the semester after Dr. Falwell went to be with the Lord, we had 515 students. And the Lord continues to bless us. Today, we have over 700 students that are studying to be worship leaders. And Sharon, if you could pull it back to this picture, we've merged together in 2012. If you'll scoot back two pictures, there you are. We, we, we established in 2012 the Liberty University School of Music, which combined the Center for Music and Worship and a new Center for Music and the Performing Arts. And today we have a little over 1,200 students in the program. There's a picture of them right there. And Olive Baptist Church's fingerprint is all around those students. Thank you. We're the seventh largest school of music in the country. It is amazing what God has done. Now let me show you what he's doing. We started this school of worship in a garage. Now, Dr. Trailer has been to that garage and preached. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was a truck garage. We didn't even have any pianos to have this music school in. I mean, we had nothing. Dr. Falwell was incredible. He would let you dream. He would let you be an entrepreneur. He would say, go, amen. This is what God's called you to do. But he would not give you one red penny. <laughs> So the Lord had to do this, and the Lord has done it all. So I can't take any credit for this. We moved into this building right here this past August from that garage. Look at here. Look, let me just show you some pictures of it. In this building, we have 50 practice rooms for the students to practice in. Adjacent to that is a computer lab where we can teach students finale and some other software for doing music with computers. We have a 150-seat choir room, a 250-seat band room. Uh, there's some other classrooms right there. We have five of these classrooms right here. It's amazing what God has done and what He's doing. I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for the thumbprint that you placed around me and knowing how to be a servant leader. I want to thank this pastor. I love this man. He taught me how to work in a big church. I come out of these little churches and the, <laughs> he, took a, he took a risk in taking this little free will Baptist boy and bringing him over to Olive Baptist Church and says, okay, go and do what God called you to do here. When Dr. Falwell called me, he says, Vernon, I want you to come up here and I want you to teach our young people to do what you do at Olive Baptist Church so we could construct a curricular program based on the model of our own staff over here. You have made a contribution to the kingdom of God that you didn't even know you were making. And I just want to thank you and I want to thank the Lord for all that you've done for our family and for the Center for Music and the Performing Arts the Center for Music and Worship, and now this new Center for Music and the Worship Arts Building. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings on this incredible church. I ask your blessings on this pastor and his incredible staff. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you've raised this church up to be a testimony for Jesus Christ, for the glory of God. Thank you for the impact, impact they've got in this region. Lord, I ask you to continue to bless them. I ask in Jesus' name that this church be known as a church that cares for the community and praises Jesus for what he's done in their lives. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, your favor will be upon their ministry until you come in the clouds of glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, we're in this uh, series called Together, and we're in it together because together we can, and together we shall. Together we can do more than we can do by ourselves. And so we're looking at this word, and we come today to look at the unity of the Spirit. Paul speaks of it in Ephesians 4, and we'll read only verses 1 through 6, but really this thematic thread runs all through the verse 16 verses of Ephesians 4, and we'll end with verse 16 in just a little bit as we conclude uh, this morning. Some of you are here, and you need to unite with Christ today. You need to be saved today. Some of you are here, you need to unite with Olive Baptist Church. You do that by moving your membership here from a church that you've come from, or you would, as that gentleman was baptized, you'd come by baptism uh, into our fellowship and unite with us. But if you're going to unite with the Lord, unite with the church, it is a spirit work that has to be done. The key element here is not that we decide who number one is, but that we decide to be one, one all together. Paul speaks to the church at Ephesus and says, you follow along, beginning in chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. There is our thought for the morning. In the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. Verse number five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all, the unity of the Spirit. Paul uses a lot of illustrations when he talks about the church, but I believe his favorite and the one that he uses here in, in verses 4, 12, and again in verse 16 is that of the body, the body, as we come together with the body being whole. Uh, that means the feet and the hands and the head and the hair and the nose and the ears and the eyes and the tongue and the teeth and the liver and the gallbladder. Parts is parts, you know. And Paul speaks about putting all the parts together. <laughs> now, Jesus is the head. And we are the parts. But if the parts are severed from the head, you don't have a body, you got a corpse. And I'm telling you, I've preached in a lot of churches that were not bodies, they were a corpse, dead. I'm grateful to God I pastor a church that's alive today. And that the body parts come together to function. It's not all about the hand or the foot. It's not all about you, not about me. It's about us together as the body of Christ. So this morning, let's look at this word unity and see four items about this unity of the body of Christ. Number one, he speaks to the character of the unity. That's in the first three verses where he gives us these characteristics. Most of them would be a fruit of the Spirit. But if you're going to be united as a church at Olive, then you must have characteristics that put us together. Last night, uh, we were here late. Uh, Pace High School had their football banquet. Coach Lindsey, who's one of our deacons in this service today, uh, was here and uh, his last one is he's retiring and uh, so they slipped Emmett Smith in 
from the Dallas Cowboys and Escambia High School. I, I spent about two hours with him at last night uh, over in my office before and after the banquet and holding him there and keeping him away. And, and we began to talk about uh, just varied things. And he and his brother were here, and they asked me two questions. They said, well, first of all, how long have you been the pastor here? I said, 25 years. They said, my Lord. He said, that's unheard of. That doesn't happen very often. I said, no, it doesn't. He said, how old is this church? I said, well, it's 120 years old. He said, my goodness. They won't know how, how you hold a church together for 120 years. And we began to talk a little bit about our history. Let me tell you, friend, a church does not stay and last without splintering and dissolving and dying unless there is unity of the Spirit. And that unity comes through the character of its members and its parts. And the character is found here, as he says, in humility, all humility. It means lowliness of mind. What that word means in the Greek construct is you're not a smart aleck. A lot of smart alecks in church. Just popping off about stuff they ought not pop off about because they don't know enough to pop off. But when you think you do, that's when you pop. There's got to be humility. Lowliness of the mind is what he's speaking of. Not a know-it-all, but we come together needing each other. Secondly is gentleness. That second character quality is gentleness. We translate it in the King James's meekness here. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a trait of the Lord Jesus where it spoke about him being meek. That word gentle is really strength that's under control. It's like a mighty stallion that runs wild but is then broken and saddled and comes to be a servant because that great powerful animal has come under the control of another and there is a gentleness, a meekness. That's what has to happen to you. It's what has to happen to me. In all of our strength, we, we come broken before the Lord. Thirdly is patience. Notice he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. The construct there speaks of suffering long. The word long suffering, 1 Corinthians 13, that great love chapter says that love suffers long. If you're going to make the church go forth in unity, they're going to have to be some people with long suffering. Amen. You, you move through some things that are not pleasant, but you suffer long. There's humility, gentleness, long suffering. Number four is the word persistence. Persistence. Notice it right here. Diligent, verse three says, being diligent to preserve the unity. You, you got to keep it in the bond of peace. You're, you're persistent. Amen. Now that word diligent, its root it means to study, like these students have to study. Vernon showed us all those classrooms where they have to study. That, that's this word here. You, you, you must be persistent in what you think and, and how you study and you're diligent as you look and bring together. But then there's one last one and it, it's found uh, in, in our text here in, in the end of verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, patience, showing tolerance, oh my, for one another in love. Hmm. You ever have to tolerate some church folks? That never happens to me, but I know it does you. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Now, tolerance can be a very negative word. There's some things you ought not tolerate. Our churches and our land, we tolerate some things we shouldn't tolerate today. But in the church, tolerance can be a positive as well. It, it's like two dogs. You got a big dog and then you got a little puppy. You've seen them. You've had them at your house. That larger dogs, three, four years old, and then you bring a puppy in the house. 
Oh, a puppy is a lot of fun. Sharp little teeth chew on everything that you on your shoes. They yap and bark. And that little dog will jump on the big dog. And they'll chew on the ears of a big dog. And they'll bite and bark. They can't whip the big dog, but they aggravate it. And what's that large dog do? He tolerates the pup. Why? Because he knows that puppy will grow. And he's got to, friend, there's some yapping you got to tolerate. They'll grow up. Now mark this down. If that little dog turns two and keeps yapping, <laughs> that, that big dog will finally say, I've had enough. <laughs> and will grab that younger dog by the nap of the neck, drag him out in the yard, give him a lesson, and he'll straighten up. For the young Immature, you, you tolerate them growing. But when it's time to grow up, sometimes you got to take a believer out in the backyard and have a come to Jesus meet. Ah, some of y'all been in that meeting, have you? I've been the taker and I've been the taken. Amen. You see, what characterizes us is the unity, the unity of the Spirit. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the body. It's about the honor of the Lord. And, and so together, we can do it. But it takes character. It takes humility and gentleness and patience, love, persistence, and a tolerance of bringing people Along. There is the character of this unity. Secondly, in this text, we see there is the church of unity. Notice it in verse number four. There is one body. Seven times he uses the word one. It's a perfection number, a completion number. He says there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope. And in, in verse this is the church. There's one body, the body of Christ. There's to be one body. We come all together as one body. And then there is one spirit. The one body is the entity. That's the church. The one spirit is the entrance into the entity. The only way to get into the church is to be born of the spirit, to be regenerated in new birth. Now hear me. There are many evil spirits, but there is only one Holy Spirit, all kinds of evil spirits. But the Holy Spirit draws you, births you, regenerates you, saves you, and places you into the one body. All together, Hillcrest, East Brent, Potential, Emmanuel, first, second, new hope, all churches, we come together, we're in the body. It's amazing to me how we kind of get aggravated and competitive with one another. Reminds me of the story I read years ago of the two men that Jesus healed of blindness. One is in Mark 8, and the other one is in John 9. Two people that were blind, and Jesus did it different. To one of the men, when he found him blind, he spit in the ground, made a mud pack, and put it on his eyes, and healed him. To the other man, he didn't do that. Spoke a word and healed him. The story is that these two men years later got together and said, I was blind, Jesus healed me. I was, he said, what happened? He, and these guys would not go to church together because they got healed differently. 
and they started two denominations, the Mudites and the Anti-Mudites. So, you know, Jesus, the only way he does, he's spit in the ground, he made mud, he put it on my eye. Well, he didn't do it to me. Well, he said, I bet you're still blind just putting on. And we laugh at such, but you know, in the church, sometimes we're just as silly because there's not a unity in the body. You see, the church is a church of unity. I'm working, I shared with you last week. Next Sunday, I think I'll announce a date to you when we're going to have a, a solemn assembly and we're going to call churches together, Baptists and Methodists and Assemblies of Gods, and we're going to come together and we're going to have a Sunday night prayer time asking God to help us to have the fire of God fall on all of us. I've been praying with some of our local pastors, met one last week, meeting with three or four more this week, and, and so we're just trying to, it doesn't mean we're all going to believe and do exactly the same thing on non-essentials. But those that claim Christ is Lord, the deity of Christ, inerrancy of Scripture, fullness of the Holy Spirit, we got more in common we let on, and so we need to come together as the church of unity. Amen? The unity of the Spirit. There's the character. There's the church. Thirdly, there is the confession. And I almost made this the whole sermon today, but I want you to see it. And it's, it's right here in verse 5. I believe it, it could be the confession of the church. Let's just read verse 5 all together. It's just six words, so read it and say it out loud with me. Here we go. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One more time. Let's say it together. That could be our confession. It's enough to bring the church together as we confess one Lord, one faith, one baptism. When we say one Lord, we're saying I'm saved. When we say one faith, we're saying I'm sure. When we say one baptism, we're saying I am separated. Let's look at those. Number one, one Lord, one Lord, I am saved. Romans 10, Romans 10 and verse number 9 speaks to us about this thought of confessing Jesus as Lord. And when you go uh, over to Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, we find that confession, Jesus is Lord. We believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now hear me, friend. If you're going to be saved, you've got to have one Lord and you're not it. You've got to leave the lordship of yourself and come to the foot of the cross and make Jesus your Lord. That's how you get saved. You cry, Lord, save me. Jesus is Lord. And our confession is one Lord. One, just, just one Lord. Not two, not three, not ten, not seven, but one. Jesus is one. There's not another like him. Muhammad is not like him. Buddha's not like him. Nobody's Lord except Jesus Christ. He's our Lord, and therefore I am saved. One Lord. Secondly is one faith. One faith says I am sure. Amen. It is the body of, a, of our faith. It is, it is what we believe. It's Jude, verse number 3, where we find, and let's flip over there to Jude, right at the end of your Bible. In Jude, verse number 3, you, you'll find it, beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing to you that you contend earnestly for the what? The faith, the one faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith, it is the body, excuse me, it is the body of our, our faith that we draw together. It's what we believe. It's how I'm sure. Now, let me just I want to ask you something. Are you sure that you know that you're going to heaven when you die? 
Now, how do you know that? It's not because of the way you feel. It's because of what the Word of God says about you. Your sins are forgiven. You've got faith, and that faith is all that God has given us. It is the faith once for all delivered to the saints. There's one Lord, and I'm saved. There's one faith, and I'm sure Jesus is the faith. And thirdly, there's one baptism, one baptism. And it says, I am separated. I am separated. Now, some people, when you read, will say this is spirit baptism, but he's already dealt with spirit baptism when he talked about it uh, a few verses back, that there's one spirit. But, but here, there's one, ba- this is water baptism in this verse, in verse number five, just like that gentleman was baptized this morning. If you've never been baptized, you ought to be baptized because in baptism, it says that you are separated. Baptism is a bold, daring profession of separation unto Christ. It says three things. It speaks about your past redemption, a present regeneration, and a future resurrection. It simply says in the past, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Presently, I am living in regeneration. I am made new in Christ, and it points forward to that that is coming in future resurrection, that we are buried with Christ and we are raised out of the water. If you've never been baptized, let me tell you, when, when, when Paul wrote this talking about one baptism, nobody was baptizing infants. Nobody was sprinkling. The way of baptism, the mode is that of immersion. That's the only kind of baptism you'll find in all the Word of God. They walked down into the water. Jesus walked down into the water. That's why I tell people all the time, I I want to be buried like Jesus. I want to be baptized like Jesus. Don't cremate me, put me in a hole. Number two, the way Jesus was baptized, the way I want to be baptized. It's the way you ought to be baptized. So if Jesus is your Lord, you ought to follow him in baptism. Believers, baptism by mercy. I've shared with you before, while in Texas almost 30 years ago, that we baptized a boy one morning with a long ponytail all the way down his back. I baptized him. After he came up out of the water, He shook his head like a sheepdog. He wet me all over. I couldn't see out my glasses, my hair is wet. We all laughed, you know, he just, his hair went everywhere, it was long. Well, after service, we went back and his girlfriend was with him that day and she walked up to me and I'll never forget it. She grabbed me by my forearm with both her hands, she grabbed my forearm right here. And she said, what did you do to Eddie? I said, what? She said, up there, and what? I said, I baptized him. She said, why did you do that? I said, well, he professed faith in Christ. Jesus was baptized that way. And she looked at me funny, and I, so I just kind of took a shot. I said, tell me, were you reared in a Catholic home? She said, I was. I said, I bet you were baptized as an infant. She said, I was. I said, tell me about that day. What were you wearing? And who did it? And, where? and she said, well, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? She said, well, I was just a baby. I, I don't know. I said, hear me, sweet girl. I'm not throwing rocks at your church. I'm just trying to lift up what we see in Scripture. But you see, baptism is not something that someone else does for you. Baptism is your declaration that Jesus is your Lord. And I'll never forget it. Brother Keith, this is the word she said to me. She said, well, that's what I like about you, Baptist. Your faith is so stinking personal. (laughs) Now, that was her modifier, not mine, all right? Your faith is so stinking personal. She meant that in a positive way. But you see, baptism is stinking personal. Your mama doesn't do it for you. Your daddy doesn't do it for you. It's what you do. It's your public profession of faith. It's your declaration it's he Lord, it, he's Lord. It is one Lord, yours. It's one faith, yours. It's one baptism, yours. You should repent and be baptized. 
If you've never done that, you ought to do it. It is the confession of unity. Everybody that's a part of this church has been baptized. It unifies us. It's one of the markers that brings us together. Then lastly, not only the character and the church and the confession of unity, but there's one last thing, and that is in verse number 6. We see the creator, the creator of our unity. Notice, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and, and in all. Seven times he uses the word one, and then he comes to the allness factor about the creator of you. Only God can make this unity because he's the God and Father, the creator. And, and in this text, notice there are four alls. He's the God of all. Does that mean that an atheist, that he's his God? No, he's in the context of the church here of believers. He is the God of everyone who believes. He's the Father of everyone who believes. We know He's not the Father of all mankind because John 8, 44, Jesus said, if you don't follow me, you're of your Father, the devil. God's not everybody's Father. He's everybody's Creator, but He's only your Father when you've been born again. And so He's speaking to the church and He's saying the Creator of this unity is all of the saints that believe. He's the God and Father of all. Number two, he's over all. That means that he has all authority and all power. He rules in your life and reigns over our lives. He's of all. He's the Father over all. He's the Father creator through all. He accomplishes his purpose in his people, the church. He, he works through us. Amen. He, he works through us. He's in us, therefore he works through us. So I believe God uses his church. How does he build this school at Liberty? He builds it through his church. Let me tell you, when they take a choir tour, they don't line up a bunch of Kiwanis clubs to go sing for. <laughs> they go sing in churches and some prisons where a lot of our Baptists are. And 32 saved over there in the prison this weekend. Amen. But you see, the church is, is, is how God works, and he brings that through his church. His church, we're not perfect as long as you're a member and I'm a pastor. We're not going to be perfect. But, but God takes us, and, and he's in it, and he works through us. He's the creator and the God of all, over all, through. And then he is in all. Friend, if you're saved, God's in you today. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20, he, he is in me and through me. Now take your Bible very quickly and, and turn over to verse 16. I want you to see this. You've got just a minute. Look at verse 16. He gets down to the end of this context of unity, and he says this, from whom the whole body, the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Let me tell you, there's a sermon series in this verse. Look at this. Let's just break it down for just a moment. Then we're going to give an invitation. Somebody's going to come get saved. Somebody's going to come unite with the church. Somebody's going to come fall in this altar and pray. Look, look at it. The whole body, the whole body, it's all of us, fitted and held together. <laughs> I tell you, the church is held together by the grace of God. What holds me together today? My skin holds me together. Keeps all the stuff on the inside that's supposed to stay in there. That has some bulges in it, but... <laughs> and some of what's on the inside keeps trying to get on the outside, evidently. But that's... We're, we're held together. We're one. We're a unit. And if your epidermis is in difficulty, then you're going to be in difficulty. 
You'll get a place where it won't heal up. We're all held together. And, and he goes on to say, every joint. I'm 62. I begin to have a little bit of arthritis every now and then. My wife struggles with it. I have many of you see me when you're Sunday and I preach. I'll point like this. The reason I point like this is because my little finger moves like that. Because it's been broken numerous times. I have a big calcium deposit on Every time I'll go to the doctor, I say, what do you think? He said, if it doesn't hurt, don't mess with it. He said, they'll come. We'll probably have to go in there and do something with that. But he said, unless it just bothers you, don't, don't worry with it. So that, that joint doesn't supply very much. It can bend, but it pops. But then your joints will get stiff. He's just using a picture here, an illustration, a metaphor for every joint. One of our sweet ladies, she's in church today. She told me this morning, said, Pastor, I'll be gone several weeks. I won't be here. And I said, why? She said, I'm having a full knee replacement. They're going to take one knee out, and, and they're going to put a, another knee in. I said three things that I want her to know. I said, number one, I'm going to pray for you. Number two, I'm going to miss you. And number three, you can send your envelope by U.S. mail, all right? <laughs> Amen. Now, they're going to take that. It's amazing what they do. Now, it used to be you just go in, you'd get a small, medium, or large and put it in there, you know. But now they tailor make those things for you. I mean, just for you. They'll take that out. I don't understand how they do all that, but it'll work. My mother-in-law's had both hers done. New knees. I know people got two new knees, two hips, shoulders, elbows. I just think about that. I mean, at the rapture, are you just going to fly apart to other places? Or <laughs> how does all that work? I, uh, well, that's somebody knows more than I know. Thank God. I'm, I'm not in management. I'm in sales, all right? So God has to take care of that. But the picture here is that every joint has its work to do. Amen. Some of y'all hadn't done nothing. It's about time some of y'all start doing some squats around here. <laughs> Every joint has something to do. I started to bring me a skeleton and hang it up here today. <laughs> I'm a biology minor from college, and we used to have a lot of fun with the skeleton that would hang in the biology department. You'd come in one day, and he'd have on a wristwatch. He'd come in another day, he'd be smoking. Come at Christmas, he have on a Santa hat. He is dead. Somebody else had to do that for him. Friend, when you're dead, you're just a bag of bones. But if you're alive, you're, that's what the church is. We're alive. We do. We're held together for a purpose of carrying the gospel to the end of the earth. That's why we're here. This group over here, they use their voice and their eyes. Their hands and they sing unto the Lord. Some of you go and preach. Some of you use a hammer and you use nails. It's all fit together, together, together. And it's according to the proper working of each individual part. Everybody in this place has got something to do. You, you have a function. You're to be doing your individual part and all of that together causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love amen that's that's what we are he just puts us together it's the picture of the body my son-in-law brad's father buddy our sweet dear friend has just gone through a stem cell transplant They tell me that when they do that, they take you to the door of death and then turn you around. But he's lost weight and just, oh, well, they just suck all the life out of you, then put life back in you. They said, as I talked to him, they, he told me, he said, Pastor, the doctors told me that you're just like a baby again because everything's new. And, and you have to be careful about 
being around people with cold, influenza, that kind, because everything is so sophomoric, so you, you. And, and then they said it, it takes 100 days from the time that you started. It takes 100 days to get back to a maturation level. He's at day 55. He's about halfway through. I got to thinking about that. I know churches that need a stem cell transplant because they're dead. They got, a, they got a disease in the bloodline of their church, and it's killing them, and they're not functioning. And a stem cell transplant in New Testament jargon is repentance. It's where you die to the old self and let, let God bring new life. And it doesn't take 100 days, beloved. Our great God do more in a moment we can do in a lifetime. You come to him, he infuses new life into you. And you're growing and going forward. That's the way the body is to be. We are to do it. What's that word? Together. We're to do it what? Together. Together. Together.